Special thanks goes to our gold sponsor, Accenture. Hey everyone, my name's Kira. I'm a developer at CultureAmp, and I'm pretty happy to be here in Vienna talking to you about Reason. A year ago, I hadn't written any Reason. I love a cheesy effect. I hadn't written any Reason or a Camel, and I'd pretty much coded in dynamically typed languages up until then. And I think how you view Reason and what its greatest challenges are really depends on which way you came to it. If you've used languages like Rust or Haskell or Scala or C++, then your perspective on what is great and what is problematic will be really different to that of a JavaScript or a React developer. For me, I'm a React and Ruby developer, so this talk is very much framed from that perspective. I found out about Reason through React conference talks, blog posts, and people I follow online. I tried it, I liked it, so I signed up to give a talk about it at a local Melbourne JavaScript meetup. A lot of my team came to see that talk, which led to us deciding to use, it, use Reason React for one of our next projects. And a couple of months later, I was standing on stage at Compose Conference in Melbourne, talking about the experience and how much I loved it, about how the React community loved it. Dan Abramov apparently loves it. Hipsters loved it. People in amazing leggings, <laughs> JavaScript legends, and Murphy Randall, who does the Elmtown podcast. Well, he loved it so much that he started Reason Town with our friend Jared. So with so much love out there, you could be forgiven for thinking that once you move across to Reason, your life will be one non-stop amazing Reason party. <laughs> so what's not to love? <sighs> Some things that are hard have nothing to do with reason and everything to do with getting started in your first compiled type-safe language. If this is your first functional programming language, you're likely going to see a whole bunch of concepts and constructs, and it's possible that you might find the new terminology a little bit confronting, depending on what, where you start and what you try and do at first. Terminology in and of itself isn't bad. It's good. It can be a concise shorthand between people who are trying to clearly communicate ideas. But if you're unfamiliar with them, then it can lead to a lot of cognitive load just to understand a conversation. And as each JavaScript or React developer skills up with Reason and OCaml, the Discord channel skews a little bit more towards the more complex conversations. I feel like it's a little bit more complicated in there than when I started a year ago, which makes me concerned for the people who come in who might find the ratio that they can understand a little bit lower than what it was a year ago. For example, this is an example of a small answer in a to a question in the Discord channel. And in this case, the person being spoken to had some familiarity with the terminology. And you probably are looking at this and don't see anything complicated about this. But I did show it to a room of JavaScript developers a couple of weeks ago, and they were like, <laughs> It, it can be complicated if you're not familiar with it. But yeah, in this case, the person was familiar with it, and it was good conversation, and everyone moved on. They just needed a little bit of clarification in some terminology, and it was mostly a theoretical conversation. But someone uh, coming from JavaScript and trying to follow along might have found it intimidating or confusing. And if you personally are asking a question and you can't understand the responses you're getting from the genuinely well-meaning people who are trying to help you, then it can be exhausting. And if you're investigating one thing after another, you can get frustrated with the lack of progress, which means you tend to take fewer breaks and get cognitive overload really quickly. And suddenly, all you know is that you're tired, you want a nap, and possibly an ice cream. <laughs> it is hard to go from being competent and knowing what you're doing in one language to being less productive and having a bunch of friction in another. And if you're in a team, you probably have a bunch of support. But if you're on your own, just remember, take breaks. Sometimes I've been able to come at things a different way. And often my most frustrating times come from when I'm spending a lot of time in JavaScript code bases and converting the odd component across to Reason, trying to conceptually map things across. And so many of the concepts either map across really well or are mostly the same, like the React component lifecycle. But other times, the one-to-one -one translation from JavaScript to Reason isn't ideal. And I find I have to remember to stop trying to write JavaScript in Reason and write Reason in Reason, because it's a different language. But if that fails, 
write JavaScript in Reason. <laughs> if you're not familiar with BuckleScript Raw, you can drop down to it um, just to write raw sn snippets of JavaScript in Reason. It is not recommended. It is unsafe. But I do think it's okay to do sometimes, particularly if you're here. I've found, in practice, the most useful part of BuckleScript Raw for me is to help you pass that block when you've tried to work out a thing, but you're stuck. And at times like this, I really wish that Jason was more of an established and solid thing, because it might even avoid me help, uh, help me avoid uh, the use of BuckleScript Raw altogether. I was so happy when I found Jason. Um, I'd love to see it more developed, and I really should dig into it to see what I can contribute, but from what Javi said, it sounds really difficult. <laughs> but the idea of having something where you can put in how you do it in JavaScript and have it spit out suggestions, even just suggestions of how you do it in Reason, that would be gold, that would be so helpful. And Javi, what you've done with Rebind, look, amazing. In any case, BuckleScript Raw is not a tool I reach for often, but is an option when you're in a situation where you, you tried to work out a thing and it's just not clicking for you. And you're pretty sure that solving this issue won't change the way you do anything else that follows. A lot of us know the dread of having a simple thing blow out and being sidelined that, by that seemingly simple thing. And at that moment in time, you have you, your work, and your looming deadline, and a bunch of unknowns. You didn't expect that simple thing to be difficult, and now you have no idea if every other thing you think is simple is also going to be problematic. And at times like this, I try and give myself permission to use a JavaScript snippet and keep working, reducing all of the unknowns to the point that you have more certainty than uncertainty behind you, at which point you can revisit your original problem with a whole lot less stress. And often by that time, because you've had time away from the problem, the solution comes to you a hell of a lot more quickly. Other times, if I'm having trouble with one small bit, and it's blocking me, I'll write it in a React component and then just wrap that and include it in the reason until I have time to work it through. And remember that it gets easier. And on the other hand, those parts of my React code base that are old and untyped and super hard to unravel and no one wants to touch, they get harder, at least from my perspective. For me, it comes down to when do I want my friction? Do I want my friction now or do I want my friction later? Unfortunately, I don't have any data to back this up, this claim, but it's definitely anecdotally true for a sample size of me. <laughs> so there are a few things I find unexpected when working in Reason. And they're little things, and they're quirkly things, but they can unexpectedly derail me. Like, Reason is just like JavaScript, when it, except when it's not like JavaScript, when things are syntactically the same, but don't behave the same, or sometimes behave the same, but not always. So it can really throw you off when you're going to just do this one thing, and then you get cut off mid-stride, which means that the experience can be a little bit awkward sometimes. <laughs> Let's take logging and debugging. When you first get started with Reason as a JavaScript developer, you run the instructions for the starter app, and you get this, JS log, hello, BuckleScript, and Reason. And this compiles down to console log, which is fuzzy and friendly and makes you think that you're in JavaScript land because you are, and it feels great. And so you continue on, and your workflow feels the same until something happens that makes you question everything. For example, Elaine here, who has been really active in the community um, in the recent months, he had a repo where he was importing some JSON and accessing an array that was nested in there. And he wanted to experiment with the data that he got using the BuckleScript library called Belt. And his workflow looked a bit like this. Import some JSON and access an array of objects. Log out the array, see 71 objects. Convert the array to a list using Belt. Log out the list, see two objects. OK, log out the array length and the list length, and they both say 71. So this was weird and confusing behavior to him. I have an example of this workflow, but in order to fit it on the slide, I only have five elements, um, where each element is an object. Here are the result of the first array logged out, and he's converted that array to a list. OK, so I'm just going to. All right, so we've got the first array. And we've got first object, second object, all the way down to fifth object. And we can see all the elements in there. So we've got the length using array length, and then the length using list length, and they're both five. 
And down here at the bottom, we've got, he's logged out the list and he's got first object and second object, and that's fine, but then it's, and it did log out more than two objects, but it's just this weird object array thing. So yeah, it's just a bit of weird behavior. But what was going on was clearer when you simplified the example. For example, a list is a singly linked list. So when it's logged, it's nested, it's represented as a nested array, which is fine, except that JSLog, I don't have big enough ears, except that JSLog functionality only passes to a certain level of nesting. So here you've got the eight elements, and then you log it out as a list, but you can see that beyond the third element of the array, everything is just kind of smooshed together. So the solution to logging lists is to convert the lists to arrays and hope that your arrays aren't deeply nested, which after this we knew, but before this was a weird blocker that was unrelated to the actual problem he was trying to solve. So this in and of itself is a small thing, it's a quirk, and it's easily dismissed once you know, but every quirk and every workaround has the price, <laughs> you pay the price of time lost and cognitive load. All right, so an example of the JavaScript syntax being a blessing and a confusion is with the spread operator, because we're used to using the spread operator in JavaScript. And we can prepend to an array, we can append to an array, and we can do both at the same time. But when you move to reason, you find that some of it works, but then some of it doesn't. And if you start out with the bits that don't work, but you've actually seen it in use before, you might hunt further, because you know you've seen it in use somewhere. So you might think the issue is that, oh, of course, it just doesn't work with lists because it's an array spread. So you try arrays, but it's just not a thing, which I wouldn't think was a thing if I hadn't seen somewhere in my GitHub trawling that it was a thing just for this one case of prepend in, in a list. So it's small and it's niggly, but j just those things where you have to just try and remember that one use case for where you can use something, that just seems to give you a bit of mental overhead. I love the foreign function interface. I love the pragmatic nature of it. I love that I can do stuff outside of reason. It was one of the big, biggest selling points to me with Reason and Reason React, that, that we could do this with JavaScript interop. The foreign function interface is really powerful and also means you can have both rock solid type safety and flexibility. But getting started with externals is quite challenging, possibly not again, thanks to Javi. Um, for a lot of people, while I feel more comfortable now, this wasn't always the case. And this next example is adapted from Johanathan Sharvitz's blog here on creating buckle script bindings, which I want to give thanks to because it was the first time I really started to understand externals. So here we have a JavaScript snippet called Bob at the top, and underneath that we've got the reason interaction. And so we're defining the snippet as an external value at BS val external Bob. And in the type declaration, we're using BS set and BS get to ensure that we can access and mutate the properties. Down at the bottom, you can see that the syntax um, to access the object's property is with the bob hash hash name, et cetera. So it's great that we can do this, but I do find it a bit long-winded and a bit hard to pass, particularly when your JavaScript equivalent is this. The other thing that's tricky, and I had somebody come up and talk to me about this as an issue that they'd had personally, um, when you're writing wrappers for third-party libraries, you can get waylaid by not realizing that the wrappers you've made have been optimized away. And you think that initially you're not writing it correctly, but you are, it's just buckle script being awesome and doing dead code elimination if you're not using it yet. Of course, when you get stuck, you can always check the docs. As a Reason React developer, I'll often end up with a Reason tab open, a React, Reason React tab open, a buckle script tab open, an OCaml tab open, and because I don't know the React API off the top of my head, also a React tab open. So let's take JS interop, for example. I love it, but if I need to talk to existing React code, I'll have my um, React wrapper information open. For general reason, I'm often jumping, jumping between the reason language docs and the reason examples that are given in the buckle script documentation. And because each of these entities are their own separate thing, I mean, you, you can use BuckleScript without ever using Reason. It's hard to find fault with the situation, but remembering what you read in what doc set can be fraught, and you can waste a fair bit of time just trying to tra track something down that you know you've seen somewhere. 
And this came up in the ResinML forum not so long ago, how it could be desirable to have some unified documentation generated. And someone came back with the in interesting point about how they wish they could toggle off the OCaml examples in the BuckleScript documentation, because currently they're always getting misdirected and reading a lot more code that was irrelevant to their current situation. And they'd really like a way to reduce the mental overhead that they're experiencing. Which brings me to here. When I started this talk, I made a list of the things that I hope will improve in reason, things that I've found problematic or difficult or just plain niggly. And my plan was to discuss these and talk through the examples. And you might notice that some of these could appear also on a list of reason strengths, because they're not mutually exclusive. But once I removed the things that are already well known as issues, JSON and async, to fix, the more I saw a pattern emerge from the examples that I explored the more I realized that the individual examples mattered less than the whole. What I was actually trying to talk about was cognitive load. And when I, first, when I started looking at Reason and the Reason React ecosystem through this lens, I realized that some of my difficulties could be categorized and could be named, at least theoretically. And just like code smells, they have patterns that you can follow to try and address them. And while there's too much theory to examine in detail right now, I'm just going to take a small detour to provide an overview. So cognitive load theory espouses that the difference between a novice and an expert it depends on the content of your long-term memory. So if you want to become competent in anything, you need to first build a set of schema and long-term memory on that subject. A schema can be defined as a set of linked mental representations of the world, which we use to both understand and respond to situations. It's like pattern matching for the brain. If you think of a champion chess player, they're a champion because they've spent years learning chess configurations. And they have a network of complex schema that means that they know the best moves associated with any configuration that's presented to them. So how do you build schema? Schema is built by perceiving and selecting new information from the huge amount of sensory inputs in your environment and processing that new information in working memory with the assistance of what you've already got stored in long-term memory and either a similar is simulating that into your current schema or replacing that with new schema or building entirely new schema. And Laura talked earlier about cognitive biases, but schema are thought to be difficult to dislodge and therefore considered the root of cognitive biases and resistance to change, with people being more likely to retain information that fits their current view of the world and discarding or diminishing the importance of information that doesn't fit. There are no limitations on the amount of data that we can perceive and no limitations on the amount of data that we can store in long-term memory. But there are limitations on what we can process in working memory. So our bottleneck is here. Because working memory is really limited and only can hold about seven plus or minus two elements at any given time, and only for about 20 seconds to about two minutes, it's really important that the information is received in a way that will maximize your learning. So this is where the cognitive load part of cognitive load theory comes in. There's a couple of different types of cognitive load, intrinsic and extraneous. And intrinsic load is how complex or difficult the information is and how many moving parts it has. Extraneous load is caused by how you consume the information. Extraneous load doesn't contribute to learning, but just takes up precious space in working memory. So the aim is to try and maximize learning by understanding what causes extraneous load and getting rid of it. When the information is super simple, it won't matter how the material is presented really. If it all fits into your space of working memory, you'll be fine, you'll learn. But when the content is difficult or complex and the extraneous cognitive load is also high, then the total cognitive load will exceed your mental resources and you might not learn anything. Structuring learning material to reduce load that doesn't contribute learning will help if, in the end, the total load falls to a level that is in with, within the bounds of your mental resources. When you do this and the material is still too much to take in, you need to be able to isolate an element and find a logical piece that is small enough to consume. But when you're the learner, you're not really the best person to know how to isolate things and what the best element to consume first even is. And this is where having other people create structured pathways is so important. The concern about unifying documentation, that learning code smell, if I can use the term, 
can be named as split attention effect, which occurs when learners have to process and integrate multiple and separate sources of information. Wanting to not read through examples that are not relevant to you, that's an example of the redundancy effect, where you're spending mental resources on things that don't contribute to your learning. Which brings me back to here. It's bugged me a bit that last year I stood on stage and said I found Reason React easy, because it's not a helpful narrative to people who are starting who do have difficulty. Yes, we found it initially easy, but we could have just as easily found it very hard. We just happened to not try and do any of the hard things at the time. <laughs> what we needed to do was represented by either the docs or the example repo or the recent Discord ch channel discussions that we'd read. And we had enough examples of how to do things to get us started. It was only later when adding other features and functionality that we started to hit more issues, and mainly of the unexpected niggly kind. For the most part, I found it easy because I was able to leverage my existing React knowledge, my React schema, that I'd spent quite a while building up before I'd ever heard of Reason. So instead of being stuck at the front door, learning a new language before being productive, I was able to immediately move in, unpack, and be productive straight away. And the places I got stuck, in many cases, it's because I was relying on my React schema too much, and my Reason and OCaml schema isn't nearly as solid. Still, being able to be productive straight away, that's mind-blowing. But it's also a bit concerning, because if writing React with Reason is a great way to write scalable and type-safe web applications, and I really believe it is, it is my favorite way to write React, and I think everyone should write React with Reason, um, then what is the learner's pathway to getting on board? The learner who doesn't already have a knowledge store of OCaml, or React to leverage, or previous functional programming languages. When somebody reaches the Reason React docs, we tell them that there's an assumed knowledge of React, which for all intents and purposes, redirects them back to the React ecosystem. And if there's somebody who doesn't even have a strong JavaScript background, then they're going to need to do a whole lot of things that are learning that isn't really relevant to what they're going to be building in Reason. Then, if they come back, they're going to need to do another bunch of mental adjustment to understand what parts of React are available and how to adapt their React knowledge to Reason React. And their newly created and po possibly not yet solidified JavaScript knowledge is going to get shaken by all of the similar but different aspects of JavaScript and Reason, things that look like JavaScript but behave differently. At which point, they'll probably realize that they're going to need to focus on learning Reason in a much deeper way. And if they seek a structured pathway, they're likely going to be sent off to work through real-world OCaml, converting examples from OCaml to Reason, which, because it involves extra steps and indirection and causes extraneous load, is not an optimal way to learn. And in the inevitable need, <laughs> and in the end, there's also the inevitable need to understand BuckleScript, after which we might have one very confused kitty. <laughs> At which point, <laughs> so, so books like Real, Real World OCaml, Eloquent JavaScript, and the You Don't Know JS series are great because they're well-structured, well-planned pathways to learning that breaks down the whole to digestible pieces and builds up the knowledge gradually from a solid foundation. It's well-organized, rate-limited instruction. Personally, I'd much rather see a pathway that doesn't send people away to React or a camel or buckle script entirely and instead pulls, instead pulls the majority of inputs together to some sort of cohesive whole. We're still just at the beginning, and there's been so much progress in the ecosystem made since I started back at React 1.5 or something. We've got reducers, we've got a router, we've got subscriptions, much better error messages, and so much more. We're also part of a broader ecosystem that is experiencing massive growth. In this thread a couple of weeks ago, Laurie Voss of NPM mentions that there are something like 5 million NPM users with less than two years' experience, with a million of them just having started in the last six months. So I'd like to finish by thanking all of those of you who've been breaking things down and providing the beginnings of pathways for those one million people who started with NPM in the past six months. Whether you're creating community resources like example repos, or writing books or blog posts, or answering questions online, or asking questions and then posting repos with the solutions once you find them, or running workshops and dojos, 
or contributing to better error messages, or simplifying, simplifying our ecosystem at the language level so it's more digestible, then you're helping create things that will help people build schema, which will enable them to help the next generation. And for that, I say thank you.